Isaac Hernandez. And I'm Holly McClure. And this is Faith on Film, a program designed to keep you informed on everything that's happening in the world of faith and family entertainment. Holly, I'm a little scared about today's show. (laughs) Well, you know what, Isaac? With so much evil on television and in movies, and I mean blatant, showing demons and and showing the devil and Satan, and there's a show called Lucifer. I mean, we're surrounded by it more than ever before, and they just want to make it like it's like no big deal, right? That's what Hollywood is. Remember, Disney recently uh, released the series uh, called what was it, Satan something or other? I don't even know. Little demons, you know, about demons. And about the, the the girl Antichrist. I mean, it's gotten yeah. sad and ridiculous. But well, today we have a guest who actually has had a hell. He had an out of body experience. It was he wasn't deaf, but it was an out of body experience. And it happened, I think, twenty four years ago, a while. But um, I was one of the first radio shows that he did, and he came on and we and he talked about his experience. And I'm telling you, after that, he's been all over the world. He has shared the story. Mm-hmm. The he has a book called 23 Minutes in Hell. He has a ministry. He and his wife Annette have a, an amazing ministry, and he has traveled all over the world. And millions have been won by his story and his account. So, without further ado, let's bring him on. And we have Bill Weiss with and Bill. So Great. good to have you on today. Thank you, Holly and Isaac. A blessing to be on your show. Um, Thank you. I, well, I just, for me, this is like 24 years. I think it's 24 right. years later. It was 1999. We were talking about when was it? And it was about this time because it was in the fall, right before Halloween, right before October. Mm-hmm. And you came on and talked. And I mean, you, at that time you had a beeper and it was like, zzz, 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 the beeper was going off. So many people were calling. You know, Holly, it's interesting. I found the original cassette tape. Here it is with on your show. Oh my gosh! Cassette. Oh my gosh! APRZ. <laughs> yes. And it's right. It says September of uh, '99. Yes. So, oh right. my gosh. Oh, uh, there it is. And there it is. And we have journeyed from that point on. And I have loved um, watching you two, you and Annette, because for years you gave of your own money. You were you were successful real estate people in, in, in Orange County. So you had your own, both of you, your own careers, very successful careers in real estate. But you used your own money after this experience happened. You traveled, you spent time for six or seven years and then got a book deal with Strang Publications. And they published your book, which I think is now almost two million. I mean, 1.8, somewhere around there, copies sold. And um, so it's been so rewarding to see God take you on this journey, you and Annette, and the stories you've had to tell and the testimonies. It's amazing. Well, it has been amazing. God has really opened up the doors. And, uh, you know, I already shared it with my best friend, and he asked me to come to his Bible study. I went reluctantly three months later, and then it spread from there. So for the next seven years, my wife and I, we paid our own way. We traveled around the country. There was no book then, and we never took any money from anybody for those seven years. And then after that, the publisher approached us and asked me to write the book. So it was not something I was looking to self-promote. But I was happy to write the book because I could place in there all the scriptures to do with hell. You know, it's not that important for people to believe my experience. I'm just a signpost to point them to the scriptures and by those be persuaded. So I have over 150 verses in my first book and over 250 verses in my second book about everything I saw is in the Bible. So that's what's important for people to know. Oh, my gosh. Well, let's Isaac, let's let him tell a story. Let's let's, let's get tell right into the what, story. All right. I know. And, and I mean, I know we don't have long, but if you can, and I hate to do it yeah. briefly, but at least give an overview of what happened yes. to you. Yes, absolutely. Well, uh, first of all, like you said, I was a real estate broker and we had a Bible study and a prayer meeting that we attended every Sunday night. And so it, we came home from that meeting, nothing unusual about the night. I had never studied the topic of hell. I've never gone to dark movies. I've never drank. I've never taken drugs. And I never had a vision before and went to bed, got up at three o'clock in the morning just to get a glass of water. And uh, Holly, Isaac, suddenly I was pulled out of my body, like being drawn up out of your body. And I saw my body fall to the floor and I began uh, traveling down this long tunnel and it was getting hotter and hotter. And then I uh, entered this open cavern like area and passed through there. And I landed on a stone floor in a prison cell in hell, rough hewn stone walls, bars, filthy, stinking, dirty prison, but like a dungeon. And I had no idea how I got there or why I was there. Nothing was explained until the way back. But I could not believe the intense heat. I wondered how could I be alive in this place? I knew I was in hell. And like I said, I don't know why I was there at this point. And um, face down on the floor, 
uh, in this dungeon, you know, Isaiah 24, 22, Proverbs 7, 27, Job 17, 16, many scriptures talk about uh, prison cells and bars and so forth. Well, that's what I saw, actually, stone uh, floor, stone walls and bars. And uh, I wanted to get up and run out of the cell, but I noticed I had no physical strength. But Isaiah 14, 9 and 10 and uh, Psalms 88, 4 mention that you have no strength in hell. And so any movement takes tremendous effort and help, you know, but Acts 17, 28 says in him, we live and move and have our being. So even movement comes from God. It's not automatic. Well, I looked up and I saw these two beasts in the cell. Uh, they were demons, reptilish in appearance, bumps and scales all over the one's body, huge jaw, sunken in eyes, claws about a foot long. And these particular two were about 12 or 13 feet tall. That's not an exaggeration. There's scripture for that, too, but I'll keep moving. And they were pacing in the cell like a vicious caged animal. They had the most ferocious demeanor about them and an extreme hatred for God. And they were blaspheming and cursing God. Then the one demon grabbed me, picked me up and threw me into the wall of this prison cell. I collapsed on the floor. I felt as if every bone in my body had broken. Now, maybe a spirit doesn't have bones, but it sure felt that way. And then the other demon grabbed me, picked me up and dug its claws into my chest and just tore the flesh open. I could not believe this was happening to me. How could I survive this? Why am I still alive? Now I have to explain one thing. The pain I felt was blocked. I only felt a small amount of the pain. And the Lord explained on the way back that he blocked most of it, but he did allow me to feel a small amount so I could relate to people that it's not metaphorical. It's not state of the mind. It's real literal pain you're going to feel in hell. And he blocked most of it, but the amount I felt was enough. But something else I noticed, Holly, first of all, I noticed I had a body. Matthew 10, 28 says, fear him who was able to destroy both soul and body in hell. But I noticed there was no blood or water coming from the wounds, you know, like it would be here in our body. But Leviticus 17, 11 says the life of the flesh is in the blood. Well, there's no life in hell, so there's no blood. Oh, wow. And then Zechariah 9, 11 says, thy prisoners out of the pit where there is no water. There's not one drop of water in hell. And these demons have no mercy over you whatsoever. They have an extreme hatred for mankind. Well, about this time it went dark. Now, I believed it was God's presence there to illuminate it so I could see. Uh, but then he withdrew his light, his attribute of light, and it resumed its normal state of absolute pitch black darkness. I mean, you cannot see the hand in front of your face. But Lamentations 3, 6 and uh, Jude 13, many other scriptures talk about blackness and darkness and hell. And anyway, but you can literally feel the darkness. And that's not an exaggeration. Exodus 10, 21 mentions a darkness that may be felt. Because it's so wicked and so evil and so penetrating, it seems like the darkness just impenetrates every cell in your body. Now, I was taken out of this prison cell and I was placed over next to this large raging pit of fire. This pit was about a mile across. I just understood that with flames raging high up into this open cavern. And again, it was not metaphorical fire. It was real, literal faint, flames. I, I felt the heat. I saw the flames. But more importantly, it's what the scripture says. Psalms 11, 6 says, upon the wicked, he will rain fire and brimstone and a horrible tempest. Psalms 140, verse 10, let burning coals fall upon them. Let them be cast into the fire in the deep pits. And Matthew 13, 49 and Isaiah 33, 12 through 14, many verses about the fire. But Holly, this is where I could first see people. There were literally thousands of people inside this pit burning. Wow. Now, most of us have never seen a person on fire unless you're a fireman. And it's the most horrendous sight to see a person burning now you cannot distinguish a man from a woman it just looked like flesh hanging off their bones and the screams were so loud and deafening you want to escape the screams but you can't you have to endure that for all eternity now i descended when i went there i ascended when i left so i understood though that i was down deep in the earth but more importantly there's 49 scriptures that point out where the current hell or sheol uh, is the Hebrew word or uh, the Greek word is Hades. Uh, it's currently down deep in the earth. I'll just give you two. Ezekiel 26, 20 and number 16, 32 and 33. Very clear, it's down deep in the earth. But I also understood there were different levels of torment and degrees of punishment. Remember, Jesus said in Matthew 23, 14, you shall receive the greater damnation. And that infers a lesser damnation. Or Matthew 10, 15, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. Uh, and praying is a less tolerable and so forth. Hebrews 10, 28, how, mu how much worse of a punishment. But my point is there is no tolerable, comfortable level in hell. Any level is far worse than you can imagine. Wow. Now, I, I thought about my wife. I thought about how we're up on the earth. And, you know, Holly, this was really a tormenting thought. And Isaac, um, I knew I would never get to her. I could never see her again. I could never tell her I love her. And I could never even say goodbye. 
And you don't realize how tormenting of a thought that is to have no finality with your family. See, they don't know that you still exist. Death does not mean cease to exist. It means separation from God. You still exist. You're just down deep in the earth. And to not be able to say goodbye and to live with that for all eternity was really tormenting. I wanted to talk to a person, just anybody, because there's pleasure in conversation and being with people. But those people I saw in the pit of fire, they're all kept at a distance Besides, you're burning and in torment, but you have no conversation, no fellowship. It's just a complete useless wasting away. You know, and Ecclesiastes 9, 10 says there's no work, no device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in Sheol. There's no purpose, no destiny. And it doesn't matter if you're somebody famous here. No one would know who you are there. And you're forgotten in hell. The stench in hell is the most foul, putrid, disgusting, worse than any open sewer. Uh, you know, the demons have a foul odor to them. Jesus rebuked the foul spirits, Mark 9, 25, yeah. but also the smell of burning flesh and the smell of burning sulfur. And if you go to Hawaii to the volcano, they have signs posted where you cannot go past a certain point because the toxicity coming up from the volcano, it's called sulfur dioxide. It's toxic. If you breathe it, it'll kill you. Well, sulfur is just another word for brimstone. And the word brimstone is all through the Bible. So you're breathing in this foul, putrid, disgusting air that you don't want to breathe. But there's not enough air to breathe either. You have to fight for even the tiniest bit of oxygen. And maybe only an asthma patient can relate to this or a fireman. But this is how you breathe. It was like, <clears throat> that was as much air as you could get. Wow. So you feel like you're going to suffocate. But see, Isaiah 42, 5 says, the Lord gives breath to the people upon the earth. You're not upon the earth. You're down deep beneath the earth. God is very specific with his word. Uh, you need to sleep in hell. Just like here, we need sleep. You never get to go to sleep in hell. And Revelation 14, 10 and 11 says, uh, and they shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the Lamb and in the presence of the holy angels. And the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night. Now, that primarily means no rest from the torment, but no rest of any kind. Because Isaiah 57, 20 says, the wicked are like the troubled sea that cannot rest. But, you know, rest is a blessing from God. Psalms 127.2 said the Lord gives his beloved sleep. Well, you're not his beloved, so you don't ever get to go to sleep in hell. Wow. If you stayed up for two nights before, you're pretty much, you can't function after two nights. <laughs> you know? uh, well, in hell, you need sleep also, and it gets progressively worse. Oh I was standing next to this big pit of fire, and demons were shoving people back in, and I was standing beneath this cavern walls that ascended upward. And all along the cavern walls were demons of all different sizes and shapes. Some were two and three feet tall. Some were 12 and 13 feet tall. But everything was twisted, deformed, and grotesque. No symmetry to their bodies and so forth. And I was standing on a bed of maggots literally maggots crawling all over everything and everybody. Wow. And, um, you know, Jesus said, where their worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. And Isaiah 14, 11 says, where the maggot will be spread under thee and the worm will cover thee. Uses the word maggot in the original. And, um, you know, I know this is disgusting, but if a dead animal is being eaten by maggots, after they consume the flesh, maggots die. That's why Jesus said, where their worm dies not, because the flesh is never fully consumed. So as Job 24, 20 says, the maggot will feed sweetly on thee. I mean, is that disgusting enough? Yeah. Yes. You're hungry. You never get to eat. You never get to drink a thirst. Do you remember the rich man Jesus talked about in Luke 16? He wanted one drop of water. Now, if I was to give you one drop of water, that would not suffice, mm -hmm. right? You, you wouldn't value one drop. But in hell you would. You do anything to get that drop of water that you'll never get. And the fear level, to share this part, uh, the fear is so far beyond anything you can imagine. And I'm just going to share quickly an experience I had so people can understand the level of fear that you have to endure in hell. I used to surf when I was a teenager. I was 17 years old surfing off Cocoa Beach, Florida. And it was about 100 guys out that day, big day. We're about a half a mile, quarter mile out off the beach. And the guy next to me got his leg torn off. Sharks. Blood was all over the water. I got up on my knees on my board to get my legs out of the water. And I was on a nine-foot board. The shark passed by. He was longer than my board, came back, bit my board in half. And then that shark grabbed me by the leg, his mouth, and pulled me down under the water. Now, you can imagine the fear that I felt at that moment. I mean, it's pretty terrifying. Well, that fear that I felt at that moment paled in comparison to what you feel in hell. Wouldn't even register. But see, Psalm 73, 18 and 19 says, you cast them down into destruction where they are utterly consumed with terror. I mean, this terror lasts for all eternity. But Holly and Isaac, thank God, the shark, and, and there was a miracle that day, and not only opened, yeah. opened his mouth and let me go, but I didn't have a mark in my leg. 
Wow. That's impossible. It was a tiger shark and they're vicious. And so God was looking out for me then. And I was not even a Christian then. Wow. But I got saved immediately after that. So <laughs> I bet you did. I did. Now, now you didn't know you were a Christian at the time you were all, this all was happening. You did not know that you believed in God, right? Right. God blocked that from my mind. Uh, now you say, where's that in the Bible? In Luke 24, 16, when Jesus appeared to the disciples on the road to Emmaus, it says their eyes were holden that they should not know him. John MacArthur's commentary and Matthew Henry's commentary point out, they quote, they were kept by God from recognizing him. God hid it from their minds and he hid it from my mind for this reason. You see, if I was there as a Christian, which I was, but I didn't realize, I would have known, praise God, he's getting me out of here, right? Our, we, as Christians, we know our destiny is heaven. Yes. But he wanted me to experience what they feel, hopelessness. You see, Isaiah 38, 18 says, those who go down to the pit cannot hope for thy truth. And we know Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. They have no hope for him because it's too late. And Holly, that's the worst part of hell. Understanding you'll never get out. You'll never escape this place. There's no friend to come help you or talk to. There's no angels. There's no God to pray to. You're just isolated and by yourself forever and ever. And, and that is really unfathomable to try to grasp eternity. You'll never escape it. And so that's why this decision people need to make here in life about repenting and receiving Jesus as their Lord and Savior, they have to realize how important this decision is. Because one second after they die, it's too late. They won't get a second chance and they'll never escape this place. So how did you get out? Well, as I was looking at all this horror, uh, demons shoving people in, maggots, snakes, there were snakes all over. Uh, something began lifting me up this dark tunnel. And then in, in this pitch black darkness, suddenly this bright light appeared. Now, I knew immediately who it was. Uh, when Jesus shows up, there's no question in your mind who he is. And I didn't see his face. I just saw the outline of a man standing in a white, pure, holy light. And I just called out his name. I said, Jesus. And he said two words. He said, I am. And when he said that, I went out. I don't know if I passed out or died. I can only explain it through Revelation 116. When John saw him, he said his countenance was bright as the sun, and I fell at his feet as one dead. Well, after a time, he touched me. And when I came to, it hit me so strongly, even though I had been a Christian for 28 years at that point, I realized that if he wouldn't have gone to the cross, I would be in that horrible place for all eternity. Wow. I, I just was so grateful for what he did for me. And the creator of the universe gave his life for me. I didn't want to ask him any questions. I just, thank you, Jesus. I love you, Lord. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for giving your life for me. I just kept repeating that. And after a time, um, thoughts though came to my mind and he would answer my thoughts. Psalms 139.2 says he answers our thoughts are far off. And um, I had eight different thoughts. I don't know. I might be able to just have time to get on a few, but you know, I thought, Lord, why did you send me to this horrible place? He said, because many people do not believe hell is real. He said, even some of my own people do not believe hell exists. Now, that statement surprised me. I thought all Christians believe in hell, but we have found out since many believe in universalism or annihilationism or soul sleep, many false teachings. And so, again, that's why he wanted me to share the gospel with people and point them to the scriptures. Let them know there really is a hell. It's eternal. And you won't escape it. If you deny Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, this is where you'll end up. Well, I now, thought, Lord, uh, why did those Go ahead. Well, I was going to ask you something, because first of all, I don't even want to spend 30 seconds in hell, let alone 23 minutes. So no, I'm, yeah. glad, I'm glad God chose you to experience this so that you can share it and not me. But I can tell you that I don't serve God because I don't want to go to hell. I serve God right. because I love him and because he's just shown himself so, uh, so amazing and so real in my life. But I agree. So do you think I'm assuming then that you that, that well, that God knows that there are people that are going to need to see this. And that's the only thing that's going to get them to give their life to the Lord. Uh, is, is that yes. why you're doing this? It's a twofold reason. Number one, for people to get saved. So they understand what we're saved from. See, a lot of people teach, oh, receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And they never tell them, save from what? And so most churches today aren't even talking about hell at all. So people think, ah, maybe I'll fit Jesus in my life. Yeah, maybe. Well, they need to be told, this is what you're saved from, number one. Because they don't have a love for Jesus yet, you know, when they're not saved. But they do have to understand, and even Jude 23 says, some are saved through fear, pulling them out of the fire. So there are people get saved that way. And of course, also Romans 2, where they're saved by his goodness. 
but a lot of people won't be saved that way. But even the people that are saved that way, it's important to hear what they're saved from. So number one, you have more of an appreciation from what you're saved from. Number two, then as a Christian, you'll walk more in the fear of the Lord. You won't live compromised. Uh, number three, you'll have more of a passion for the lost. Yes. So you'll want to witness because you think, man, people think I didn't know hell was this severe. I can't let my family go there or my friends. See, you won't pray just a little nice prayer. Oh, Lord, save my family. No, when you understand how severe hell is, you'll get on your knees. Wow. You'll cry out. You'll pray and fast. And you'll say, Lord, send labors across their path. Give them a dream or a vision. Open up their eyes. Open up, touch their hearts, Lord, that they don't have to go to this horrible place. See, it, it puts more of an urgency in the person's heart to pray. So it's a twofold. It's reaching, reaching the Christians to be more impacted and more of a, a right. witness. And in, as unsaved, they need to hear, this is what you're uh, facing. If you deny Jesus, this is where you're going. So it's actually a message of love because it's a message of warning. You know, we saw about 11 years ago when Hurricane Ike hit the Gulf Coast. It said in the front page of CNN and a newspaper there in Galveston, it said certain death to those who don't vacate. Now, you wouldn't say the writers of that article were mean for issuing that statement. No, you'd be grateful for the warning. You heed it, and you get out of the way, and you live. So it's the same thing. Jesus talked about hell in 46 different verses because he was, wanted to let people know this is where you're going if you don't repent. So it is a loving message to give a warning. You know, what loving parent wouldn't give their child a warning not to play in the busy street, mm -hmm. you know? And in fact, when you, um, we, we kind of cut, of course, a little bit, but you had gone out of this tunnel up above the earth with Jesus right. and you were asking him questions. And, um, and then what, like, how did you get back down in? Cause I think that's the important part where 23 minutes come in. Right. Right. And you knew it was 23. Right. Well, like we said, we were in this tunnel. We went above the earth in a whirlwind tunnel that extended. There's scripture for that too. But anyway, we came above the earth and we exited the whirlwind tunnel that extends out of the earth. And then the Lord um, showed me the people I had turned around and I looked at the people that were dying on the earth that didn't know Jesus. And they were falling back down that tunnel, back down in the hell, one after another, after another, after another. And he allowed me to feel a piece of his heart, the anguish he feels for a soul going into hell. Uh, I couldn't stand it. I said, Lord, I, I cannot stand even a, a little bit of the love you have for people. Uh, you know, Ephesians 3.19 says his love passes knowledge. So he loves us far more than we love our own family members and children. And so he wanted me to remember that, that passion, that love he has for people. So I would be motivated to go and share the gospel. But there were so many people falling one after another back down in the hell. Well, then we proceeded up on the earth and we came, uh, passed through the atmosphere and came up to our home. And I could see right through our roof and I saw my body lying on the floor. It was so strange to be outside your body. I thought, that's not me. This is the real me, the spirit man. Uh, the body looks so temporal. It looked just like um, how you would look at your car. It's a vehicle to get you around in, in life, but it's not you. That's yeah. how the body looked. It's just a vehicle to get us around in life. But anyway, I, I came up to my body and I entered back in my body. Well, when I entered back in, the memories of hell flooded back into my mind. You see, when I was traveling back, I was traveling back, traveling back with the Lord and perfect love casts out fear. So I had no fear and it was just wonderful being with him. But when he left, then the memories of hell came back to my mind and I started screaming and I went into a traumatized state. Well, my screams woke up my wife. And the first thing she did is look at our digital clock, which read 323. So I got up at three o'clock. I looked at the clock. That's where the 23 minutes comes from. And then when she found me on the floor, I was literally in a ball rolled up on the floor screaming. And that's not my nature. I'm very calm by nature. And um, I screamed out, pray for me, pray for me. The Lord has taken me to hell. And she prayed and God removed the horror, but he left the memory. Now we know he can divide both soul and spirit. So somehow he removed that horror part and left the memory of it. But um, anyway, it, uh, then I calmed down and I told her all about what happened. And actually, the first thing I did was ask for a glass of water. <laughs> not a drop I, was so thirsty. I know that sounds you know funny now but at the time in hell no. there you know revelation 21 8 equates uh 21 6 equates water with life well in hell there's no life so there's no water and mm -hmm. to see life contained in a glass it was so beautiful to see water and so you know my wife and i have become water aholics <laughs> I even collected from all around the world wow. different spring water bottles. But anyway, I would too. I would too. No. Uh, appreciate water, you know. And you were in the living room when she found you, so you were in a completely different place than when you got up out of bed. Right. Well, I got up out of bed and I was walking through the living room, and that's yeah. where I was pulled out of my body was in the living room. Okay. 
and my body fell to the floor and was left where I where I left it. Now you said something so, that really caught my my uh, my ears when you said it, and that was you said that the demons hated mankind. Right. Why do you think they hated mankind? Well, we're made in God's image. Uh, and uh -huh. John 15, 18, Jesus said they hated me before they hated you. Men hate Jesus because they're influenced by the demonic realm. And men hate other men that are godly. And so demons hate the thing God's created because we are made in God's image. And uh, he knows, the devils know they're going to hell. And um, and and we're the apple of God's eye, the human that's being. That's so that's it right there. Yeah. That is so awesome. And also, and also in, in this whole story that you've done and told, you have traveled all over the world. You've traveled to different churches and you don't even have time to tell all the stories. But I mean, you've gone on radio shows and you've been challenged and they've said things to you like, I'm going to throw some questions to you and you, give, you know, tell some of the answers like, well, I'm a good person. I deserve to be in heaven. You know, right. I just, why would I go to hell? I deserve to go to heaven. Why would? And I love the analogy about going up to someone's house. Tell that one. Yeah. Well, first of all, I explain them that the Bible says in Romans 3.10 and 3.12 and many other places that there is none good. No, not one. So in God's sight, uh, his standard is different than ours. James 2.10 says we offend his law. In one point, we're guilty. So there's nobody that keeps everything perfect, that never lied, never cheated, never uh, had a lustful thought. There's even a scripture in Proverbs 24, 9, it says, even the thought of foolishness is a sin. One foolish thought would exclude you from heaven. So that's a high standard. So none of us are good, number one. But number two, this might help people, an analogy. Uh, if you think you're a good person, you should go to heaven. You know, if you went and found the most expensive home in the country and you knocked on their door and you said, uh, excuse me, but I'm moving in with you because I'm a good person. What do you think that people would say? No, right? They have no relationship with you. I said, but people go through their whole life. They have nothing to do with God. They deny Jesus as a son of God, which he said is the only way to his house. Then at the end of their life, they have the nerve to come knock on his door, demand to live there because they're a good person. What does good have to do with it? They don't know him. They have no relationship with him. See, God offers to be people's father throughout their whole life, but they push him away. And so God's our creator. He's not their father till they invite in Jesus as their savior. Then he becomes their father, and then they have the privilege of living at his house. So they're not in his family. So why should you live at someone's house that you're not a part of their family? So that, that analogy helps people understand. Wow. Uh, Bill, can you stick around for another show? Because we've run out of time on this one, but I, I feel like there's so much more. Holly, what do you think? Is there much more that we need to talk to Bill about? Let's do. There's more we can talk about. Let's yeah. definitely do. Let's do that. Now, but before we go, just in case some people don't come back to the next show, where can they, where can they reach you or how, how can they find out more about what you're doing, Bill? Our website is 23minutesinhell.org the numeral 23, or soulchoiceministries.org. Soul, as okay. an S-O-U-L, soulchoiceministries.org. And you have more videos and film and teaching films and tell your story so people hear even more of what happened, they can go there. Yes, we have many videos and everything's for free. You can watch it and um, many videos we have. Uh, it's all up there on, YouTube, on our website. Great. Well, folks, thanks for uh, tuning into today's show. You must tune, tune into next week's show as well because there's so much more to, to this story, all right? Mm -hmm.